And yet, um, you know, Herbs for me with Tony Furuti as, as their lead composer, there was about much more. It was a fantastic band, you know, with fantastic kaupapa in their songs. And I still rate that guy as my favourite New Zealand composer. But I'll, I digress. <clears throat> now, when Aotearoa started doing what we were doing, people were saying to us, oh, you know, man, what are you guys doing that stuff for? This is all new stuff. Māori have never done this stuff before, you know? Which is a load of rubbish. There has been a long history of Māori musical activism, you know? And if you look at that first quote at the top, no ne ona tāke. It is, a, it is a haka written by a, a Ngāti pro rangatira called Tuta Niho Niho. And um, the haka was called Te Kirimutu. It was um, first performed in 1888. And it is a rant about the council rates, about the way that the, um, the council was trying to kind of uh, you know, push itself over the top of the Māori landowners. So he wrote this, this particular haka. And it's, and it's vitriolic. It is, you know... Um, makes some uncomplimentary statements about the council and about Pahe people in general. But it is a protest against the takeover of Māori rights in, in the Ngātipura area. This one here is even worse. This is written by Tweening Ngāwai to the tune of that song, you know, I'm moving on, that song. And in that particular song called Te Mātauranga o Te Pākeha, which was written in the 1930s, she makes the statement, Te Mātauranga o Te Pākeha, he mea whakatō hei ti nanatanga mō waira, mō hātana. So the knowledge of the Pākehā was made manifest, and for whose benefit? For Satan's. Okay? So it's pretty, it's tough, it's tough stuff, you know? Um, David Grace wrote in Rua Kenana, in his song, you know, in, in, the, um, in the late 80s. He told his people not to go to war, let the white man fight the white man's war. O Rua, Rua Kenana. And so this activism has been going on for a while, so it wasn't new, and I kept saying that to people. This is not new. We haven't invented it. We're just carrying on a long tradition. And David Grace is still around today. And really, he rocked, rocked um, the Pau 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 concert in May. But you see, in the 80s, and in the 70s, along came this new thing. And I've called it Hiwakaho, a new vehicle. And it was called Rike Music. And it was called Rasta, and Bob Marley was out the front. And I remember the first time I ever heard um, reggae music was in '78. I'd come home from school, from St Stephen's up in Auckland, which, by the way, is closed down now for a variety of reasons. <laughs> but I, I, I got back, and we had a, a boarder staying with my grandfather and my cousins, and he started playing lots and lots of reggae music. And in particular, I think it was the album Babylon by Bus. And that's all I heard from the time I got home to the time I left. He also liked the smoke and he was growing plants up in our, in our ceiling. <laughs> and I think he would have been kicked out if they found out. I never told of him. Um, but I, I heard this music, you know, and it was right in the disco era. Um, <clears throat> and I hated disco. I hated the pinstripe suits. I hated the glittery shoes and all the rest of it. I just couldn't stand it. So reggae comes along and I'm thinking, this stuff's pretty good, you know. But what I started to, what really got me, I suppose, first of all, was the lyrics. I couldn't believe the stuff that Bob Marley was writing and what he was writing about. You know, uh, man to man is so unkind, um, children, uh, man to man is so unjust, sorry. Children, you don't know who to trust. Your, your best friend could be your worst enemy, and your worst enemy your best friend, because only he would know your secrets, only he would reveal them. And I just, I just couldn't believe it, that this guy was actually nailing the stuff. and was, you know, just a, 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 an unbelievable way to look at the world. And then I noticed lots of my cousins started to like it too. And, um, and lots of other people. And so when I was asked, why do you think Māori people took the reggae the way that they did? I think the first thing is way to eh? You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a spiritual music. It's a music that reflects a particular spirituality. And I think our people picked up on that really, really quickly. Because I think it's one of the reasons I think that hip-hop hasn't really exploded with Māori, because it doesn't have that spiritual dimension. Reggae does. <clears throat> I think the second thing for me too is the struggle, you know, the struggle that Bob Marley was talking about, the protest that he wrote, I think he was the greatest political scientist that's ever been, musical political scientist that's ever been, but he wrote about the struggle and he was able to write about it um, very succinctly and he was able to articulate it really, really well. I think, for me, I used to get heaps of people complaining, oh, why are these Māori's growing dreads and why do they think they're Rastafarians? I said, well, I'll tell you what, bro, I'd, I'd prefer that they found something positive in that than, you know, than in crime or doing something really, really negative. 
So what they had come across was this very, very positive black identity in a country where being Māori wasn't celebrated. So it became their identity. <coughs> that was part of it. But this last one, I think people would say to me, oh, you're, you know, you're a bit mad you know, saying this, because there's no actual um, you know, uh, data to back up what I'm saying here with this last one. It's, it's an assumption, it's a feeling that I have. And a lot of music is that, you know. It's that we share rhythms. When I, um, and, and the first time I think this became apparent to me was we were doing um, Exodus, and, um, and, and we, used to, we used to start off doing Exodus first because you could have a big long you know, sound check. It was like having a second sound check, so the drummer would go up first and bang away there. Then the bass player would get up there, and then the keyboard player and the guitarist and whatever, and the vocalists up last. So you could do that for five or six minutes, you know, it was great. But I got up there one time and I thought, oh, you know, this is a staunch Māori audience, so I've got to do something. So I was, and I got up and I says, Ko wai nehi e tu wake nehi ko ngauri e nehi o nga tipuna and kept on, on running it through there and I started to realise just how much those rhythms, you know, matched up with, with traditional Māori rhythms. And if um, in all my latest album what I've done is I've used a lot of poi playing triplets, you know, so and all the reggae songs and it just fits. So for me, I think at, at, at some deeper level, our people are picking up on those rhythms. They're picking up that there is, there is stuff that we share and there are, there are commonalities within the music. Not just within the, um, within the identity or the struggle, the political messages, or, or the spirituality, but also in the music itself. Um, <clears throat> and I think for me, this is, this is, these four things are the, most, uh, you know, are the most important things for me. There might be other things that come up from the, the following speakers, and that's cool too. Um, and what's happened, um, I suppose, if I look at um, He Reo Ho, A New Voice, Kaupapa Māori Music, for me, if I was to sum it all up, I'd say it often combines reggae and the Māori struggle. It's a vehicle to put across Māori messages. Um, I think it also reflects Kaupapa Māori principles as well, because it has to be, because that's the difference from other types of music. Um, it's often bilingual, it's not exclusively in Te Reo Māori, in fact, more um, Kaupapa Māori music is actually in English than it is in Māori because a big part of it too is communication. I think um, the empowerment uh, of Māori people with the treaty as the framework for engagement, that's another, uh, another big part of it. And one of the things that's, um, that's really, really heartens me when I, you know, I, for instance, I went to watch Kolohe Kai at the, um, at the arena, it must have been two or three, three months ago, with our 12-year-old daughter. And the thing that really struck me was just how really professional and how, you know, how musically competent our, our, our reggae musicians are now. Um, and I was really blown away by 1814. Just absolutely loved them. Um, and Sons of Zion were great as well. So when Kapura Kolohe Kai got out there, they had such a hard act to follow. And, I, you know, three songs in and after, Have You Ever Been In Love? <laughs> and uh, Has Your Girlfriend Ever Left You? <laughs> I said to my, turn around to my back, I said, let's get out of here, man. I'm too old for this shit. You know? It's poppy reggae versus kaupapa reggae. You know, it just drove me bats. <clears throat> but the Aotearoa reggae stuff that I heard, you know, was, was, was awesome, and I was just blown away, and they called it Aotearoa Reggae, you know, and I said to my mate, see, I was part of starting all of that, <laughs> you know, and there are other pioneers here in the room, so it's really, really gratifying to see that reggae music, or Aotearoa Reggae music, has a whakapapa that's approaching 40 years, it's awesome. Mm. Oops. So, I want to thank you for listening, I'm uh, hoping I haven't spoken too fast or filled you up with too much too soon. I'd like to thank Robbie for um, inviting me along and also um, acknowledge Tingi and Ruya, uh, Nando, um, you know, for, and uh, Miriam for being here today and also old friend like Chris who I haven't seen for a long time. And I was, I was talking to Chris earlier and it was probably about 1986 we were making up some posters that, you know, the old posters you, you leave a big box down the bottom and you put the gig and the date in it. And uh, I went along there with, um, with the bass player 15-year-old bass player and the 14-year-old percussion player, Mark McGregor, who's now a fantastic musician. <coughs> and um, I wish I hadn't taken them actually, because we got out of it on the fumes from the, from the poster, you know, from all the printing ink. And so for the first two hours, we just laughed and laughed and laughed. And then for the last two hours, we just came, oh, I've got a sore here, I've got a sore here, I've got to get out of here. Um, yeah, but me um, uh, So thank you for listening, and ngā mihi nui kia
Makura pen, Makura pen, Maku koe a fie, Kite ara ara tupu, Maku koe.